All right, welcome. In this video, we're going to be recapping CalBC Unit 1, and that was just all about limits. And so we had four lessons. We started with the definition of a limit, and then the next time we came back and we talked about limits that involved infinity, uh, limits as x went to infinity, and then limits around vertical asymptotes where the limit came back infinity. In the third lesson, we talked about continuity. We got a definition of continuous, and we solved some problems related to that. And we learned about the intermediate value theorem there. And then in 1.4, we learned about the definition of the derivative. Um, we talked about slope at a point, instantaneous rate of change, that type of thing. And then I also told you about the mean value theorem. But this is not something, mean value theorem, that's not something that's going to appear on any of your assessments until like the third unit or something. So, I mean, I'll go back over it in this video, right, because we talked about it in unit one. But if you're, you know, preparing for a test or, or going back and trying to prepare for a retest, you don't need to be worrying about the mean value theorem today, right? It's just something you need to be aware of. All right, so now I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a little deeper dive on each of the topics that we talked about in unit one. And I'll have a few example problems for, for, each, um, for each lesson. Okay, so the first thing was the, the idea of the limit. And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw a picture to remind you of our definition. And maybe I'll just say, hey, this is 3, and this is going to be, I don't know, maybe that'll be 2. Okay, I think that'll be enough for us. And if we had something like, maybe it was like this, and oh, maybe this is going to need to be 4, right? Um, we had a function that looked like this, and we're looking at a picture of its graph. Well, we said that the limit, and this is the graph of f of x. I should probably label this. This is f, yeah. That the limit of f of x, as x approaches 3 from the positive side, what I'm thinking is I trace along the graph as x is approaching 3 from above, right? So I'm tracing along the graph, and I'm saying, hey, what's happening to the y-coordinate here? I'm getting closer and closer to that filled-in circle which is at a level of y equals 4. So I say that this limit is going to come back 4. Okay. If you were asked about the limit as x approached 3 from the negative side, we'd think the same thing. OK, x is approaching 3, but from below. And we're going to think, OK, what's happening to the y-coordinate? Well, as I approach along the graph, the y-coordinate is getting closer and closer to 2. I don't actually care about what's happening at x equals 3. That's why it's the limit as x approaches 3, not f of 3. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, but I'm seeing that as I approach 3 from the left, y is getting closer and closer to 2. So I'll just say that this limit is equal to 2. Okay. If somebody was to ask you what's happening to the graph of f at x equals 3, that's where we care what's actually happening at x equals 3. Okay, and that's going to be the filled in circle, and that's going to be 4. Okay. But I've got more to say about this, right? Because these were just one-sided limits. And I need you to remember the definition of the limit, which I'm about to copy in here, which is that the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists and equals l if both of the one-sided limits also exist and both agree and both equal l, right? So I would say, if somebody asks you about, oh, OK, hey, the limit as x, uh oh hold on as x approaches 3 of f of x, okay, I would say that fails to exist because I'm seeing two different things. The number in blue and the number in red are two different numbers. right? I would need those to be the same in order for it to exist. Okay, So you know, knowing all of that, I'm going to kind of clear out this example and draw you a picture of one where the limit is existing. Okay, so in this picture, from the right, okay, I'm approaching equals 4. And from the left, I'm also approaching y equals 4. So if they ask me, oh, okay, what's uh, the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x, that situation, since I'm going to the same number, well, that's going to be 4. Okay. And then f of 3 would equal 2 there, because I've got that just little filled in dot. Okay. I feel like there was something else I was going to say about this. Well, if I think of it later, then I'll just, I'll just throw it in there. Okay, so let's move on to 1.2. In okay, 1.2, we talked about limits that came back infinity, which were also, you know, exactly the same as horizontal and vertical asymptotes, okay, or limits as x went to infinity. So I think first I'm going to talk about vertical asymptotes and 
limits that equal infinity. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of write that in real clearly, just kind of work in red while I'm doing this. Okay, which I do want to remind you is the same as the limit of f of x going infinity. Limit equals plus or minus infinity. Is that that's kind of visible? Okay. Now, the cause of a vertical asymptote is going to always be division by zero, okay? It's gonna be, and to draw you a picture of it, it's one where the graph, you know, I don't know if it's going both up or both down or one to each side, but just from one side, say it's, you know, it's going up. It's going to get as close to that vertical line as you like, but it's never going to cross it, which means that necessarily it has to keep going up forever and it goes up to infinity. Okay, so what I would say about this is that yeah, this is caused by um, f of x equals some number divided by zero. At least, uh, when I say some number, I mean some non-zero number. Up to like maybe after canceling factors on top and bottom, if there were common factors. Then you get non-zero over zero. That's going to be the cause of a vertical asymptote. Okay, and so if, oh, I know what it was, but that wasn't, yeah, well, my advice for 1.1 is really more advice for, for 1.2. So I'm going to just kind of throw out a couple of limits here, and then, yeah, I think this, I just need to make this smaller, and then I'll be able to, yeah. All right, so let's do a couple of examples. The limit x approaches 2 of, of, yeah, maybe 2 from the positive side, sure. x plus 2 over x minus 2. Okay, now anytime you're confronted with an algebraic limit where it's like, hey, here's a limit, and then the thing you're taking the limit of is not just something you're looking at a picture of the graph, your first recourse should always be to just plug in, okay? Always just plug it in. So if that happen, if I try to just plug it in, I get four on top and zero on bottom. Okay, that's that's bad news. Non-zero divided by zero, that's evidence of a vertical asymptote. Okay, but in this class, we're not going to just be able to throw our hands up and say, "Oh, limit doesn't exist," because what can happen is on multiple choice, I could give you this exact same problem, and I could give you two answer choices: one is positive infinity, one is negative infinity. Right, so you need to know which one is it approaching. And so when that happens, we're going to do a little bit of analysis here. Um, you know, this is going to be at x equals 2, the one that I'm interested in. Okay, if we're approaching from the positive side, I'm going to pick some number just a little bit bigger than 2. Like, I don't know, maybe 2.1 or 2.01 or something. And that should be enough for us to see. If I choose 2.01, I'm going to have... Actually, I'm going to write this down. Okay. Then I have 2.01 plus 2, well, that's 4.01 divided by 0 0.01. And that's positive divided by positive. Okay, so I know it's going to be a positive number. Moreover, I can already tell that's going to be like 400. So it's really high up there. So I can tell that what's happening here is I'm at a vertical asymptote. While I'm positive, I'm going to positive infinity. So I say this limit comes back positive infinity. Okay. But if we were to be confronted with, you know, my thing about just plugging in, uh, let's say x approaches 6. I don't know. Um, I'm going to make this x uh, approaching, I don't know, 3. How about that? I was thinking maybe sine of pi x over 6, I think that's what I was thinking of, divided by, let's say, something that looks like it's going to uh, maybe x plus 3, right? They want you to see that and be like, oh, there's going to be a vertical asymptote, it's not going to exist, or it's going to be infinity or something. But if we had plugged in on this, we would see that this limit, you know, because like always the first thing we should do is try to just plug in, uh, we're going to get sine of 3 pi over 6, that's pi over 2, and Pi over 2 is up there. The y-coordinate is going to be 1, so that's okay, That's just 1. D 
divided by three plus three is six. Oh, one divided by six, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no division by zero. That's where we would plug in and we would just get, um, you know, just get an answer. Okay, and that's, I think, what I have to say about vertical asymptotes or limits that are coming back infinity. Um, it's going to come because of non-zero divided by zero. Okay, and so uh, let's talk about horizontal asymptotes because those are the ones that are a little more touched. All right, now horizontal asymptotes, those are the limits of f of x as x approaches infinity or maybe the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x because sometimes those can be two different things. Okay, I think the most important thing that I need to tell you is that when we are confronting or confronted with one of these, it's usually there's like a top and a bottom, but not always, and I'll do one of those examples too. Okay, and we need kind of our relative growth rates. Um, so this is the fastest growing where the, the heaviest object is going to be exponential. Okay. And, you know, a larger base grows faster, like 10 to the x grows faster than 3 to the x, but I'm pretty sure y'all are aware of that. Um, exponential, then powers of x. Okay, powers of x would be like x to the fourth, square root of x, um, things like that, x to the 99. Okay, e to the x grows faster than x to the 99 or x to the 9 million or really any power of x. Eventually, e to the x will grow faster. So I've got exponential powers, and then the slowest is logs. Okay, and, okay these are slow. So, okay, with all of that, I think we're ready to do some examples. Oh, and then of course, you know, the principles for horizontal asymptotes that you learned in Algebra 2 and in Pre-Cal was that if the denominator of the f fraction is growing faster than the numerator, well, that's going to go to zero. We're dividing by more. Dividing by more and more and more leaves us less and less and less. If it's growing faster on top, then we're growing while not dividing by as much, and that's going to go to infinity or possibly negative infinity. And when they're essentially the same, that's when we're going to divide the, the leading coefficients. So maybe I can get one. Um, let's say, let's get one. Oh, no, no, no need for a highlighter. Um, let's take the limit as x approaches infinity of, let's say, log of x divided by the fourth root of x. Yeah, I like that one. Okay. Now, this one, I've got log versus power because the fourth root of x, you know, I should probably go in and rewrite this as x to the one fourth power. Okay, well, any power of x grows faster than log of x. So I know it's faster growing on bottom and faster growing on bottom tends to zero because okay, I'm divided by more and more. And my, what I'm left with is less and less. Okay, so that's, that's a bigger on bottom type scenario or faster on bottom. Okay, let's, uh, let's trade these out and let's do another one. Let's say, um, yes, e to the x versus x to the 99th power. Well, exponential grows faster than any power of x. So is this growing faster on top? e to the x and x to the 99, when x is a positive number, those are both positive numbers. e to the x is always positive. And x to the 99 is going to be positive, provided that x is positive. Okay, But since it's bigger on top, I know that this one is going to positive infinity. Okay. And then a third example would be kind of where the, you know, the biggest thing we see on top and bottom are essentially the same. So maybe I will go with, um, oh, I know what to do. I'll just, I'll mix up the, do some mixed media here. Plus x to the five minus e to the x. Divided by maybe, pardon me, 2e to the x minus x to the 4, or something like that. Okay, when I'm looking at this, I have to take the top and bottom and pluck out the biggest, the fastest growing thing to compare, right? Because log x, that's not really contributing anything compared to x5, x to the x. Okay, so I go in and I see, okay, the biggest things I'm seeing are this negative e to the x and this 2e to the x on bottom, right? 
Everything else doesn't really matter. Okay, it's just really the biggest thing on top and the biggest thing on bottom that we need to compare. e to the x and e to the x, those are essentially the same. So I'm going to divide the coefficients, and that's going to be negative 1 divided by 2. Now, the important point I need to make is that this e to the x is only growing at all when x is approaching positive infinity. And that's something you need to be careful about, and I think that's what I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about. Okay, so I think what I'm going to just tell you or remind you, because I've already told you this, is that the limit as x approaches negative infinity of, pardon me, of e to the positive x, that's equal to zero. And I've got a couple of reasons for you. Uh, first, on a graphical level, if we drew a picture of the graph of e to the x, which, I mean, I don't need you to be able to put down like the most accurate graph in the world, but I do need you to know kind of what the graph of e to the x looks like in this class. It's exponential growth. But it goes back like that, and we can see that as x approaches negative infinity, y is approaching zero. Also, e to the negative, let's choose a large number, 800. e to the negative 800, you know, negative 800, that might as well be negative infinity, at least to me. That's 1 over e to the 800, right? And e to the 800 is some massive number, right? It's, it's huge. And if we're taking 1 and we're defining by a huge number, that might as well be, you know, as close to 0 as we want. And we could make that exponent of e more negative, right? And we could make the denominator of this fraction down here even bigger. So we can divide by as much as we want, so we can make the quotient as small as we want. And that's why the limit is 0. Okay. Um, clear out this discussion. And with that, I'm going to bring in a one more that is not a fraction, but you would still need to be able to figure out the limit of. All right, now this is one that you could be, uh, you could definitely be tricked by, uh, because it's like, oh, you know, x approaching negative infinity, um, x to the 5, that's going to be a huge negative number, and e to the x, well, you know, that's going to be positive infinity, you could think. And then you would think it was going to be negative infinity. But as x approaches negative infinity, this is like, well, e to the negative number. Again, it's like having, okay, uh, another way I could write this, and I'm not sure you know, why you would want to do this. Um, Wait, is that? No, pardon me, e to the x in the denominator is going to be positive. Yeah, that's what it's going to be essentially like, right? Because it's going to be the negative of a huge number to the fifth in the numerator and a huge e to the x in the denominator. And that's why this limit is going to come back zero. That's one way, uh, another way I could write it. Um, you know, and I don't want to get too bogged down in the algebra of why, you know, I'm, I'm changing from negative infinity to infinity and, you know, tra trading out negatives with positives. Uh, it's just essentially the same. If you think about numerically what's happening to x to the 5 and e to the x as x goes to negative infinity, it becomes equivalent to that limit on the right. Okay. But, you know, you're practicing for a retest. This is, this is a pretty, probably not one I'm going to use on, on a retest, right? But who knows, on a regular test, definitely. Late test, probably. Okay, so let's see. Are there any other infinity-related limits that I want to tell you about while we're here? real quick. Yeah, so I didn't do one where it's like, hey, here's a function, give me back the horizontal asymptotes. And these are a couple of ones that, that are a little tricky that we encounter in Calbc unit one that we need to be able to deal with. Okay, the first one, f of x, this is talking about, this is really, it's just a, it's a rational function. You've got degree two polynomial over degree two polynomial. And we could do the distribution, right? We could do first outside, inside, last. We could do the same thing in the denominator and get it and compare uh, the leading coefficients at the top and bottom. And if you need to do that, go on ahead. But I'm thinking that what's when I do that, what's going to happen is the biggest thing I'm going to see on top is going to come from that 6x times negative 3x is negative 18x to the 2. And then there's going to be some other stuff, right? And then in the denominator, I'm going to have 2x plus 5 times 2x plus 5, which I'm just reminding you is not the same as 4x squared plus 25. There's going to be 4x squared, 20x, and 25, okay, if you actually sit down and, and foil it out, okay? But we don't care about that. All we care about is the 4x squared and some other stuff, okay? 
because the other stuff isn't going to contribute as x approaches infinity, as x approaches negative infinity. So the horizontal asymptote for this thing, we're going to have the same behavior as x approaches infinity and as x approaches negative infinity. It's going to go to negative 18 over 4. So the horizontal asymptote is y equals negative 18 over 4. Or you could say that's negative 9 halves or negative 4.5 or however you want to write that number, right? Okay, g of x is the type of thing where we're going to have to be very careful because of that square root of x squared. And that's just one of those things that yeah, they kind of just got to remember for now. It's kind of a trivia fact. That this has got a double horizontal asymptote. And I showed you in class why, algebraically, why this is going to come back with two different limits. And I don't think, you know, I'm already over 20 minutes and I'm only halfway through the lesson. So I don't think it's going to be the best use of our time for me to go in and algebraically prove why this is what it is. I'm just going to remind you that as x approaches infinity, positive infinity, g of x is going to be a positive number over a positive number. So it's got to be positive, right? And it's going to be, you know, divide the leading coefficients because the square root of x, x squared is, I mean, really it's absolute value of x, but it's close enough to x that we're just going to divide the coefficients 2 over the square root of 25. So that's positive 2 fifths. But as x approaches negative infinity, just think about the sign of the top and the bottom, right? You take a negative number that's huge and you square it, it's going to be, well, but you know, it's going to be positive. And you multiply by 25, it's even more positive. Add 1, still positive. Square root, still positive. Okay. 2x plus 3, though, as x approaches negative infinity, that's going to be a negative number. So I'm going to say that's going to negative over positive. Um, but still, uh, kind of the same principle applies. That we're going to divide the leading coefficient. So that'll be negative 2 fifths. And I think that that is about all I've got to say about infinity and asymptotes. Let's talk about continuity. That won't take nearly as long. All right, yeah. I, I, there's not a whole lot that I need to tell you about continuity. I need to tell you the definition of continuity, which I'll just write in now. All right, so we said that a function was continuous at an x value if the limit of the function was equal to the value of the function. So let's just draw a picture of... Okay, hey, here is a function. It's going to be continuous if the limit of the function, that's the y-coordinate of the open circle, is equal to the value of the function. Okay, that would be a continuous, a continuous function, a picture of a continuous function. Okay, and uh, the, one of the most common problem types is that what value of k makes the function continuous? I'm just going to do one of those right now. So if they give us a piecewise defined function and they say, hey, this thing is continuous, what's, what value of k is going to make that happen? Really what's going on there is you've got two pieces of graph and you're going to like shift them around or, or, or mold them so that they meet up at the point that the, right? So at x equals 3, I need 2 to the x to equal x plus k. Okay. So in order to solve this one, I'm going to say, all right, 2 to the x is equal to x plus k at the point where x equals 3. Okay. So I plug that in and I get 2 to the third equals 3 plus k. I know that 2 to the third is 8. Okay. And then I'll solve for k by subtracting 3 and I'll get k equals 5. Okay. So k equals 5 would make this function continuous. All right now let's talk about discontinuities for a little bit. We've got two types. We've got removable and non-removable, and I'm just going to kind of describe them to you, and then I'll give you an example problem. So we've got removable. Spell that right. Yeah, removable. Okay, removable looks like a hole in the graph. Okay, it's where the limit exists, but maybe is not equal to the value of the function, or maybe the value of the function is not defined. Okay, this is okay. So on. One characteristic is it looks like that. Another one is that the limit of f of x exists as x approaches c. So removable discontinuity at x equals c. Okay. Also, we this happens. We learned about this in pre-cal and algebra two that that hole in the graph happens when we're able to cancel off a factor on top and bottom. Okay. So we're able to you know we're canceling. on top and bottom. Okay, but then there's non-removable
Okay, so that can that can look a couple of ways. It could be a jump, or it could be a vertical asymptote, something like that. Okay, so it could look like this. Okay, it could look like this with one of these circles filled in. It can't look like that with both of the circles filled in because then it would not be a function. Okay, but it could also be like that. I would say that the limit of f of x does not exist. And also, oh, we're not getting this from cancellation on top and bottom. We're getting this from probably division by zero if it's a vertical asymptote. And with a jump discontinuity, I think I showed you one. I know about arctangent of one over x. That's got a jump discontinuity at x equals zero. Um, otherwise, they're really hard to come by. And most of the time when we see a jump discontinuity, it's because we're working with a piecewise defined function. Okay. But I, I'm not going to write in there any of those characteristics because those aren't really like a guarantee. So, but I will oh, try that once more. Yeah, just divide that off. And I'll work a quick example for us. All right, so they could, you know, just kind of confront you with a rational function. And you might need to factor it up, but we don't need to practice our factoring right now. We're here to talk about asymptotes and, and continuity and stuff. So they could ask you, where is it discontinuous? Okay, that's all types of discontinuities. And when we're looking at a fraction, the discontinuities are going to happen any time the denominator equals zero, whether or not we're able to cancel it off, right? So the discontinuities are going to be x equals 2 and x equals 3 because they're what cause division by zero. Now, not all divisions by zero are going to cause a vertical asymptote, right? Some could cause a, a removable discontinuity, and you can see where it's going to be. It's where we cancel on top and bottom. So I will, if you are asked about removable, okay, that would be at x equals 2, right? Because I can cancel off x minus 2 on top and bottom. Non-removable is anything that's left over after cancellation in the denominator. Okay, so that's going to be x equals 3. If there were extra copies of x minus 2 in the denominator and after canceling I still had them down there, it would be a vertical asymptote still. Okay, um, it's only the ones where we knock off all the powers with cancellation that causes removable discontinuity. Okay, so that's us finding and classifying discontinuities. Let's, oh, I need to tell you about the intermediate value theorem before we move on. Let's do that. Okay, so the intermediate value theorem is, is a thing that I would say is, is I wouldn't say it's obvious, but um, it, it's pretty self-evident, okay, that if on a graph, if a function is continuous and it's going from the point 1, 2 to 3, 5 continuously, it's going to have to pass through x or through y equals 3 and y equals 4, right? and y equals three and a half, and every y value between two and five, okay, if it's continuous, okay? Now, we don't know, you know, if all we know is it's continuous, it could look like that, it could look like that, okay? I'm pretty sure we know it's a function, so, you know, it's not gonna, like, do anything too crazy, but we don't know that much. But if it's continuous, all of these ones that I've drawn have passed through three and have passed through four and have passed through three and a half, at least once, if not more than once. So what it says is if y0 is between f of a and f of b, yep, still visible, and f is continuous on the whole interval between a and b, then y0 is the y-coordinate for some x-coordinate between a and b. Okay. Then y0 equals f of x0 for some x between a and b. And it's probably provided that y0 is not equal to f, or f of a or f of b, it's going to be on the interior of the interval. So in my example, my y0 could be say four. Okay. 
same. Uh, in this case, A equals 1 and B equals 3, right? So there's got it. What it's saying is that there's some X value where F of X equals 4 between X equals 1 and X equals 3. And if I draw a picture, right, I can try to avoid it for a while, but it's going to happen eventually. And then this thing down here, that's going to be X 0. Okay. And it's, there it is, between 1 and 3. That's all I've got to say about the intermediate value theorem, though. All right, now, the last full lesson of Unit 1 was the definition of the derivative. Okay, and I think I'm going to start with average rate of change. Okay, that's just rise over run. Okay, that's just a fancy word for slope. Average rate of change. And we love average rate of change problems in AP Calculus because they're just about as easy as the, as the problems get. Average rate of change of a function f on the interval a to b, it's the same as the slope formula was in algebra 1. It's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We just have you know a little more knowledge about how functions work. So we say it's f of b minus f of a. But that's y2 minus y1. It's the difference in two y values over b minus a x2 minus x1, difference in two x values, rise over run. Okay, that's the average rate of change. And the units of the average rate of change are the units of f divided by the units of x, or the units of t, or whatever the input variable is. Okay, but then the instantaneous rate of change Okay, our, that's our definition, or that was our first definition that we took. Instantaneous rate of change is the limit of rise over run as run goes towards zero. So that could look like, I think the easiest way to understand it is the limit as run goes towards zero, h approaches zero, of rise. What happened to f when I increased x by a little bit? Okay, that's rise, the impact of making x increase a little bit divided by run, the actual amount of increase in uh, x, that was, that was h. But also, you could see limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c divided by x minus c. These are both limits as run goes to 0 of rise over run. Now, you know, Geometrically speaking, this represents the slope of the tangent line. To the graph of f at a particular x value. And notationally speaking, we would call this um, f prime at some x value. Okay, so f prime means the slope of the curve. Okay, that was that was kind of the big thing there. And then we also talked about the derivative function. Which is something that we're going to talk about so much, you know, through the rest of the semester that, uh, you know, the derivative function, I, we did some practice problems on it. But we were mostly interested in computing the slope of a curve at a point in, in this lesson. So the derivative, that's a function. that rather than reporting like the height of the graph or some kind of quantity, it's representing the rate of change or the slope of the tangent line at, to the original function at each x value. Okay. The slope of whatever function we're taking the derivative of f of x at each x value. Okay, so that's kind of like the terminology that we were working with. There was another piece of terminology that we talked about, and that was differentiable. Okay, that's also smooth is another synonym for that. And that's that the slope exists. Okay. So I'm going to draw you some pictures of things that are not differentiable. OK, 
okay? Uh, places where it's not smooth or where the slope doesn't exist, okay? I'd say uh, first would be a sharp corner, okay? This function here at this sharp corner, it is continuous because the value of the limit is equal to the value of the function, but it's not differentiable because I've kind of got like two different slopes going on from two different sides. And this would be the limit not existing because of, you know, like disagreement in one-sided limits. Okay, the limit that defines the slope. Okay, so there's not just one slope at that point. Okay, then there's the vertical tangent. And, okay, that's the spot of vertical tangents. Yeah, that's pretty clearly a vertical tangent there. Um, you think all the way back to algebra one, if you think about the slope of the tangent line, the slope of a vertical line, it is rising and not running, causing us to, when we do rise over run, divide by zero. And so that slope doesn't exist because there's no real number that represents a vertical slope. And then there's also, you know, any sort of discontinuity, okay? We would not be able to find the slope at that point because there's nowhere, like, there's no graph there, okay? Um, we also, oh no, let me erase, that's not a good sign. Okay, uh, oh, I could also say a, a worse type of discontinuity, you know, like here. Okay, there's, there's like, where would you put the tangent line? You know, like, there's nowhere to put the tangent line. And in a vertical asymptote scenario, again, there's no graph there, so there's, there's no real way to determine the slope It's somewhere where there's no, not even a graph. So those are going to be the three reasons for a uh, function to not be differentiable. Let me browse through a couple documents and make sure there's not anything I'm forgetting about 1.4. Right, so here's a nice example for us that was really at the level that we're at right now because really all we can do from looking at a graph is tell whether a derivative is going to be positive or negative or zero. Okay, but I thought this was a good example that would be helpful for us. So we're going to rank f prime of 2 f prime of 5 and f prime of 7 from least to greatest. Okay, we can do that. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to start with f prime of 2. Well, f prime of 2 is going to be the slope of the curve right here, which I'm not sure about, but I can tell that the slope of that red line is positive. Okay, so I'm going to say f prime of 2 is positive. Okay, then I can go and I can say, all right, f prime of 5 Okay, well, here's 5. I'm going to go up to the graph, and I'm going to draw, the draw in a tangent line. And I can see that the slope is negative. So I'll say, okay, f prime of 5 is negative. And then the third one is f prime of 7. Okay, so here it's 7. Okay, drawing a tangent line there. That looks pretty flat. That's going to be close to 0, so it's going to have to be in the middle. Okay, so that means that f prime of 7 is 0. And my response would be, okay, if I was ranking them from least to greatest, and we need a little more room, I'm going to say that the negative one would be the least. So f prime of 5 is less than f prime of 7, which is 0, which is going to be less than f prime of 2, which is a positive number. Okay, so I thought that was a good example for us, uh, you know, kind of like at the level we're at right here. Yeah, I had definitely made myself a note to give you any other reminders at the end and before I did mean value theorem. But the only one that I can think of right now that I haven't talked about explicitly is the function y equals absolute value of x divided by x or y equals x divided by the absolute value of x. They look the same. I just want to remind you that we need to know what that graph looks like. The, this graph is the one that it's one if x is positive it's negative 1 if x is negative, and it's undefined at x equals 0. Okay, we've looked at transforms of this graph, like x minus 6 divided by x minus 6, and, well, that's going to just shift to the right by 6. And, but then, but otherwise, the behavior would be the same. And there's lots of, like, one-sided limit questions that are multiple choice in, for college board AP calculus over this type of function. It's a type of function that comes up a lot. Okay, so I don't want you to forget about it, right? You know, you stuck with me for 39 minutes. I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of good hints. But I think that's going to be all for like real unit one, unit one stuff that you need for the test. I'm going to move on to the mean value theorem now, uh, which isn't on your test, but it's still part of unit one. So I'm going to include it in my recap, right? All right, now because it's not going to be on any of the assessments for, for quite a while, I'm going to try to keep it pretty light on the mean value theorem, just like, hey, what's the result here? And so it really, you know, we kind of start off with Rolle's theorem always.
Okay, and that says that if you've got a function and you know it's differentiable and it stays flat over some sort of interval, you know, overall, if the average rate of change is zero, then somewhere you're going to have a flat tangent. Then the instantaneous rate of change is going to be zero. Okay, so I'm going to actually draw this for you. Um, average rate of change I'm going to draw with a gray, run, gray line and then I'm going to draw some sort of differentiable function which means I can't have any vertical tangents, discontinuities, or sharp corners. So you know I'd say something like that. that that's perfectly fine. What Rolle's theorem is saying is that there's at least one place where you've got a horizontal tangent. Well I'm saying three. Okay so that happened there, there, and there. Okay. And so these are places where um, f prime of x equals zero on the interior of the interval because f of a and f of b were equal. Okay. And the function was differentiable over the whole interval. Okay. The mean value theorem is just kind of a more generalized version of this. And yeah, I'm already going off. Maybe I can just reduce the size of this a little bit. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. So the mean value theorem is going to say that whatever the average rate of change is, so say we have a function that's actually increasing, right? From f of a to f of b. And whatever that average rate of change is, Provided that your function went there smoothly, um, who knows, maybe I'll say it went underneath like that. There's going to be at least one place where the slope of the tangent, and it looks like it's going to be about here. It's harder for me to draw. But there's going to be at least one place where the slope of the tangent is the same as the slope of the secant. Okay. So what this is saying is, in fact, I'm going to Try to draw over this in orange. Um, that was a bad idea. I forgot it was going to go behind. So let's get rid of that. Let's try once more. I think it's going to be here. Just trying to make it parallel. Um, that f prime of c for some c out there is going to be equal to. Pardon me. Let's say the slope of the secant, which is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. Whereas the equation over here, um, I needed to use a different color besides gray for everything. So I'm going to just hopefully clear out. Nope, that was, knew that was going to happen. Nope. I'll give it one more. Sh can't get it. There we go. OK. Um, with these, I think I will use purple. I'm just going to try to cover it, cover it up, and hopefully the green doesn't go on top. Okay, it did. Whatever. Okay, so I'm going to say that f prime of x is going to need to be equal to the average rate of change, which if they started off the same, then the average rate of change is going to be zero. So that's Rolle's theorem here. And this is the mean value theorem here. It's an existence theorem that guarantees the existence of an x, or ex ex guarantees the existence of a c on the right, for which these equations are true. And you know, uh, this has been you know pretty long, but I, I hope it was comprehensive, and I hope it helped you as you're reviewing uh, all the things that we learned in CalBC Unit One. So really, thank you for watching.